everybody, and welcome to the business break. I'm Mike Totoro. I'm joined here with Andrew Finkelstein, the managing partner from Finkelstein and Partners. Uh, they've been in the Hudson Valley and serving all of New York State and beyond for over 60 years. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Michael. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Andrew, it's an interesting background you have behind you. Can you uh, give me a little insight as to where you are? That actually is the courthouse in the city of Newburgh. Uh, Orange County used to have two courthouses, Supreme Courts, one in the city of Newburgh and, and one in uh, Goshen. And the judges used to travel from one to the other, and then they consolidated everything out in Goshen. So, awesome. Thank uh, you. I like, I like to keep that in people's minds that the city of Newburgh used to be the powerhouse of Orange County at one point. That it was, and what a beautiful city it was. We're on our way back, though, hopefully. That's true. So everyone, uh, we're back. Uh, thank you for joining us again today uh, amidst everything that's going on. As you know, we've been talking quite a bit about uh, the PPP loans and we've also talked about some HR issues going on with the state of New York and some changes that have been happening there. We'll be back next week with some more on the PPP loans, but more importantly today, we're here to talk about business interruption insurance and there's no better person to help us understand uh, that process and whether or not we have a claim than, than Andrew. Um, Andrew's been working on some uh, different pieces with business interruption insurance, uh, and we're going to walk through those today. We're going to open it up for some question and answers, uh, as we normally do. So if you have any questions, please respond to the Q&A below, and uh, we'll get to those uh, in just a couple of moments. Um, until then, uh, Andrew, so we're trying to help all the businesses that are here in the Hudson Valley. And we've been doing all these shows really to try to find um, content and help people navigate um, these very, very challenging times. Uh, everybody has seen a tremendous drop off in business. And uh, obviously with the PPP loans, there's been some, some help there for the right businesses, but not all, right? Um, you know, I, I did see a piece and we did a blast on business interruption insurance, which uh, really led me to you. Um, on whether or not businesses qualify uh, for business interruption insurance because of the government shutdowns and the pandemic. Uh, can you give the, the audience out there some insight on, do, do they qualify? Can we qualify? <clears throat> Universally, we're being told, no, 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 you don't qualify. This is, this is definitely not, not covered. So let me start at the 10,000 foot level very broadly. Uh, that business interruption insurance it really what it is when you say qualify it, what you're really asking me is does an individual business have a contract with an insurance company that affords that benefit it's an individual business by business insurance company contract so uh, whether you qualify or not is solely dependent on the individual contract of insurance that the business has now uh, so I just want to talk about what that contract of insurance would be. Uh, there's two broadly, the, uh, this is very broadly, and the reason why everything will be broadly is there's 6,000 different insurance companies and each of them have different policies and different clauses. The language of each one is often very different and can draw different conclusions. So uh, I can't uh, provide too much specificity but I will give the broad outline, uh, but let me bottom line it right up front. Uh, the insurance industry has, at the moment this happened, a industry-wide decision to deny everything, regardless of whether there's coverage or no coverage. This is the insurance industry it is a two-pronged approach. The first prong that they've said is let's communicate to the world that if they allow these claims to come through, we will insurance industry be out of business. That is total bullshit. Uh, it's plain and simple, because if you look at the numbers that the insurance industry puts forth is the number one presumption is that all business collapses and every element of all of those businesses was insured. That's not anything close to reality. So the numbers that they're putting out there and the suggestion and the perception that they're trying to, to create is that their uh, industry is in peril. Well, 
We heard that after Hurricane Sandy. We heard that after 911. We heard that after every catastrophe. But meanwhile, if you take a look at their market value and, and stock price, there's they never have an issue in, in printing money insurance companies. So, uh, and you can see my disdain for insurance companies. I have no problem sharing that. The second uh, thing that uh, the insurance industry has done is first uh, create this uh, improper image that their, their industry is in peril when their insured's businesses are in peril. They're trying to turn that upside down. Uh, but the second thing they've done is said across the board, deny. And uh, I will share with you, this is the first time I've ever experienced in over 30 years where uh, the insurance industry has proactively gone out to their own customers, their insureds, before a claim is even made, said, you're not covered. Don't even bother. Don't even file. That's intentional. They've done it through, I've seen letters that they've written their customers saying, oh, you may think it's covered under your business uh, business uh, interruption, but it's not. Uh, and they'll, they'll cite only one sentence out of the policy or a couple's, but it's completely um, contradicted in another area of the policy, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so the, the, all of the adjusters that, or that you purchase the um, policies from immediately have been told, deny the claim, deny the claim. Just tell them, don't even go through the paperwork. Oh, why do you want to go through the hassle of even filing a claim? Because you're not entitled to anything. Don't even bother. Because they've done the, the calculations. I haven't seen them, but these are the calculations they've done. They say, well, they already know how much is their exposure. And if their exposure, I'll just make up a number, is $100 billion. And if we can get 30% of the people not even to make claims, we've already saved $30 billion. So now we're down to $70 billion. And, and that's how the, it's, a, it's a, a game of attrition. And their goal is to make it difficult so people quit and don't get the benefit that they paid for. Because that's a, that, then it's just a windfall for them. So that's my, my big comment on uh, uh, what they're trying to do, but now specifically about business interruption. And Mike, just jump in at any time, but I'll, I'll kind of outline the contract that you have in place. Uh, one is uh, the businesses pay a premium. It's as simple as this. You, you physically pay a premium and you receive in return promises. And what are those promises? And that's what the, the contract of insurance is, promises to cover certain events. And there's two uh, broad types of insurances that we're talking about. There's what's called a specific specific peril insurance where a business may go out and insure a specific event. So, um, uh, you know, oftentimes you may hear like the Super Bowl has, uh, or, or Tom Brady may insure just his arm in the event of something and making these things up. But that's what a specific peril is. It's specific insurance for a specific issue covering a specific event. The other type of insurance, which is the vast majority are what are called all risk coverages. So all risk coverages and all risk insurance is just that, it covers all of the risk. And the presumption, <clears throat> and what you should understand is the presumption in the court system is it's covered unless it's specifically excluded. Right? right. So it's broadly interpreted that you do have coverage and it's narrowly interpreted that you don't have that that coverage has been excluded. So that exclusion has to be very specific. These are there's a bunch of legal principles behind the contract, but <clears throat> it's a what's called a contract of adhesion. There's really no negotiation when they, when you buy that coverage, you're not negotiating the words or the language in each one of those exclusions. So in a contract of adhesion, where you don't have the bargaining power to actually uh, have a back and forth on the language of a particular policy, uh, it is interpreted against the person who wrote that policy. So unless it's absolutely specific and clear, and this is the really important part, there are no inconsistencies in that language, 
then it's presumed there, if, if it's written properly and there are no inconsistencies, then the exclusion is valid. If, however, there's inconsistencies or, and when I say inconsistencies, not just in that specific sentence, and this is what often happens, different areas of the insurance policy say things that are inconsistent. So when uh, a claim is made, they will only send you the language out of the policy that appears to clearly deny and say there is no coverage excluding this coverage right here. And they say, oh, you have no coverage. Yet, just in the next paragraph or in a different section of the policy or a different endorsement, <clears throat> which I'll talk about in a second, actually covers the policy, it covers the event, then you have coverage, okay? Because you, there are certain areas in policies, for example, uh, there may be a, I'll just, I'm gonna say a virus and a bacterial exclusion that excludes that, but you may have what's called civil authority endorsement, where if the civil authority, the government shuts down your business, you're allowed to make claim under that section of the policy. So a lot of times uh, what the carriers do, and I've seen several denial letters, they'll say, oh, no, no, you're excluded because of the bacterial exclusion, but then they don't tell you about the civil authority side of it. That's so, an important point, um, Andrew, just to interrupt you for one second. I mean, you know, we've, I, I've spoken with many clients, right? And, and, and some of them have filed. And to your point, you know, I was on the phone several times with clients while they called their broker and they have a relationship with their broker, seemingly have a relationship with their broker, right? Called up the broker. We've been best buddies for, you know, 10 years, however long, and call them up and said, hey, you know, I got my accountant on the other line. And, you know, we're thinking about possibly, you know, filing a claim under our business interruption insurance. Across the board, to your point, they're telling, you know, the clients and, and the policyholders, no, no, this doesn't qualify, hands down. I mean, this is so far from, from being qualified um, that it's, it's absurd almost that, that this is an act of God. This is, a, this is nothing that the insurance company is ever going to cover and, and, and really just out of, out of hand, just saying, forget it. You know, if you want me to go through the paperwork, I'll go through the paperwork. But for the most part, there's nothing here. And so this is an important point for business owners to really understand. I mean, we're going to get that kind of message, I believe, from our brokers. Because I haven't heard a broker yet say, listen, it's in your best interest to file a claim. I, I haven't heard one of them yet say that. Okay, not one. So, so for the business owner, good advice would be, look, I, Andrew, I would go to you in a heartbeat. We're not here to endorse uh, any one person, but I know Andrew and he's an expert at this. The best advice you can give somebody right now would be what now, Andrew, as a next step to see if there is an opportunity for them under their business interruption insurance policy. I absolutely file a claim uh, because this is how, uh, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, but this is how it works. You don't have a basis to uh, challenge their interpretation until you file a claim and receive a denial. If there is litigation, it is restricted to what was the claim and what was the denial. So when you file a claim, it's uh, important to file the broadest claim possible. And let me, let me just uh, share with you that the filing of a claim has no impact on your premiums, okay? You should not be concerned about your premiums. First of all, you've already paid your premiums right. and all you're doing is what you're entitled to. You've paid for this benefit. Um, and you're simply saying, I paid you for this benefit. Now you, it's time, I, I did my side of the deal. Now it's time for you to do your side of the deal. Um, so uh, let me, uh, I'm going to divert for one quick second about brokers. Uh, brokers may appear to be your friends, and I'm not saying anything disparaging on a personal level, but on a business level, their interests are not aligned with you. Their interests are aligned with the, who, you know, he who uh, pays the uh, piper hears the song, right? So it is uh, the insurance companies that they are aligned with 
Um, and they aren't the decision makers as to whether or not there is coverage or not coverage, but by making a claim, the broker now has work they have to do with respect to it. Um, and let me also add, the brokers have some liability because if you went to your broker and said, I want business interruption insurance to cover every, inf every uh, eventuality, and they didn't give that to you, and they sold you a policy that that did not cover this eventuality if you uh, were intending on having it, whether you're a restaurant or um, and in the hospitality industry is where it comes up a lot, uh, then the broker may have some liability. So, and they know it, right? Brokers have their own coverage too. And I've, I've sued plenty of brokers because they've sold something and, and communicated one thing, but sold something else in the papers. And <clears throat> just because it's in the paperwork doesn't exclude a, a claim against them. So going back to the claim that you want to make, it's important just that it be brought and it can be very simple. And I would, uh, and um, I, Mike can share this uh, language or I could just tell it to you now, but it's very simple. I would simply write, a letter that says pursuant to the pandemic that's going on and the March 12th governor's issuance of a uh, the governor's order shutting down businesses, I am making a claim for all benefits under my policy. Right. So, so what, really what I'm saying and to, to distill it away, you want to make sure you talk about the virus, the pandemic, Yep. and the civil authority and the government action. Just as broad as that, and I'm making a claim for all benefits available. It's a simple two, three sentence letter. Uh, make sure you keep a copy of it. I'd suggest you send it certified. Then the letter that comes back, okay, uh, could uh, there are a whole bunch of, it could be an outright denial. Then you're ready to um, proceed and and say that basically start uh, i'll get into it in more detail but basically start litigation and say you've denied a benefit that i've paid for and that i'm entitled to so they will either outright deny it or they will what's called reserve their rights and say uh we're we are not denying and we're not accepting we're reser reserving our rights because they have to do these things in very specific and defined time periods uh because we want to further uh, investigate your claim which they're allowed to do. Um, so that then shifts the burden to you. And what is the burden to you? You have two kind of core burdens. Um, one is the burden to cooperate, right? You can't just ignore it. You can't just file your claim and they deny it and say, that's the end of it. Uh, they can say, all right, well, we'd like to see what's the basis of your claim. What is your uh, lost profits, what are, and, and they can ask for uh, various supporting materials. So you should, you, should uh, you must provide that because if you fail to provide that, that can be, even though you may have had coverage, they can then deny the claim based on failure to cooperate. It's a contract. You have an obligation to cooperate. Uh, the second is you have a duty to mitigate. Okay. Just, you can't, uh, uh, put your head in the sand and not do anything. If you have an opportunity to mitigate, and a simple example are restaurants. If restaurants have the ability to deliver curbside or things along that line and they choose not to, uh, the insurance company may have a claim of failing to mitigate. Now that doesn't extinguish coverage. It just, it, it limits the amount you may be able to recover. So hypothetically, if, if a restaurant was making 10,000 a week and if they, could show that if they did curbside, it would have been a thousand a week. Now your claim is only nine thousand instead of ten thousand. So Andrew, I've you know we I've had a couple of people file claims with their insurance company, and I'm telling you, they got a letter back within an hour. Some of them as quick as an hour. Andrew, what 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 kind of recommendation do you have? Do we work with an attorney? Should we be working with an attorney? Because no sooner did we file the claim, I mean it was. By Maybe it was an hour and a half or two hours by the time it made it back to my desk, but it was a relatively short period of time to get a denial letter. How should business owners go about making those first those first steps? Well, here are the choices. Do nothing and the insurance company wins. 
Right. Okay. Because they've, they've put their line in the sand. They said, we're not paying. I don't care what you do uh, and how much information you provide them. They're not going to pay. Okay. The only thing that insurance companies respond to is litigation. That's my experience. Right. Um, or the threat of litigation. And that's through an attorney. Right. Um, now the, the, strength of the particular claim will be entirely dependent on the language of the contract uh, and that policy. Um, and there's, and there, as I said, there's 6,000 insurance companies and within each insurance company, they write different language for different policies. So I can't give a, um, a specific answer on any individual case because it's, you literally read the policy find inconsistencies and see if there's a claim that can be made. And then that claim is made. Now in New York, uh, the courthouses are closed and we're not allowed to start any actions. Um, but let me just talk about when it, once, once the uh, claim is made and then denied, it triggers a statute of limitations. Now, uh, sometimes within a policy, it may, shorten the statute and the whether or not that would be deemed valid that's I'll set that aside I don't believe it would um, so the it's a, a, a contract claim in the state of New York has a six-year statute of limitation so there's six years to actually bring the litigation which leaves a wide open window to put everything together what an attorney would do is send a more formal letter of representation mm -hmm. and claim letter and says i'm going to use you uh, mike i represent rbt this is all hypothetical i represent rbt mm -hmm. they've made a claim you've improperly denied their policy based on x y and z uh you if you wish to discuss this further call otherwise we'll commence action within 30 days or something like that now these uh, the litigation side of it, there's attorney, I'll, I'll just speak up from an attorney perspective. Attorneys handle these one of three ways. Um, a contingency, which means that uh, the business owner um, and the attorney are aligned in the outcome. That meaning that regardless of the outcome, unless there's a success, the attorney receives no compensation. Uh, the opposite spectrum of that is an attorney charges hourly uh, that uh, not that the attorney is not aligned with their client they are aligned with their client but they they are not outcome dependent uh, so regardless of whether the litigation is successful or not uh, the attorney is being compensated and you, you're it's affecting your cash flow and the third is some blend between the two there may be uh, some attorneys may uh, request monies up front and then uh, some contingency. My personally, I do 100% contingency. I like to be, you know, at the hip with my client that uh, I'll take the same risks as them. We lay out all the money and, and we take, we take a shot with them. Now, all, let me talk about litigation. These cases are not um, compared to some of the other litigations I'm involved. I would define this as not litigation intensive because we have the policy, we have the denial. Uh, they, they, when I say they, the insurance company may want to do a deposition of the business owner, but that I am anticipating that is not likely because what the first thing will happen is uh, we would file a complaint and then they would likely bring what's called a motion to dismiss or a declaratory, we may bring a declaratory judgment action saying the language of this policy clearly shows that there is coverage. So it, I, I'm anticipating that most of these will be decided uh, what's called on motion. Just think of it as a writing to a judge. The judge reads it. Some of the judges don't even take oral argument where the lawyers show up. The, some judges will just read the papers and write a decision. And if they deem that there is coverage, then it's just a question of proving your damages, which is the, 
business uh, forensic accounting, a whole bunch of other scenarios. So really important, keep all of your records uh, from before this event and everything that's happened because you may have to uh, provide that to prove all of your damages. And uh, there are a lot of um, benefits within policies that a lot of business owners aren't aware of, like remediation costs. There are some uh, advertising uh, for uh, where you're entitled to receive advertising benefits. Um, event loss, it all depends. Each, each policy is different. So um, there are a lot of benefits that you may be entitled to that uh, you wanna actually just, the benefits are pretty easy to find and I would encourage you to just kind of flip through your policies to see what you uh, may be entitled to get and then keep all of those records. And Andrew, how long, okay, so, all right, so we have probably the, the potential here to file for a claim and I, I believe we really should be. This is like nothing we've ever seen before. So I think if our, if our policies, um, specifically say that we, we have business interruption insurance, I think we should be investigating uh, with an attorney uh, to see if, if, if we do have something um, that we can file a claim against. But we don't know how long this is going to go on. I mean, we were talking before the show, Andrew and I, you know, is this 18 months, 24 months, you know, until there's really a, a vaccine. And even then, after the vaccine, are people really going to uh, feel comfortable, right, even after a vaccine? I, I believe yes, but I think it'll take a little time. So, you know, this business interruption insurance claim that we potentially should be making here. Now, how long is there a time frame? Is it is it you're covered for six months? You're covered for twelve months? You're covered for twenty four months? Do you have any insight what that looks like? Yeah. So uh, policies run from I'm going to say uh, hypothetically June fifteenth, twenty nineteen to June fifteenth, twenty twenty. What does that really say? That says any loss and I'm going to define a loss, any loss that happens in that time period, that one year, and they are put on notice of, then it becomes a covered loss. A covered loss isn't restricted by time, meaning that if your covered loss extends beyond the June 15th policy period, the policy does continue to cover that, provided the language of the what that benefit is. So let me kind of give a simple example. Um, there may be business interruption insurance that covers 30 days and you may make the claim June 1st, but your policy is over June 15th. It still covers the full 30 days just because the policy period is over. It doesn't mean the benefit that you pay for is over. So when you ask uh, how long will the business interruption insurance cover and what are the benefits, that is unique to each individual policy. There's no broad answer to it. But what I want everybody to understand is just because your policy has expired doesn't mean the benefits within the policy period you're not entitled to it. But the one thing you do have to do is make your claim during the policy period generally. So that's why it's important to make the claim, kind of the stake the flag in the ground. That's an important point, Andrew. I like that. I want to, I want to drill in on that just to make sure everyone's clear on that. So before your policy expires, you had better make that claim. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. And then you, you, you don't want to be in a position where they are arguing a late notice of claim and after the policy period, of course, it's the law. There are exceptions to everything, but it's, it's prudent to get that claim filed as soon as you can. Right. So let's get that claim in if we're going to do it before the policy expires. And then, you know, let's, let's really look at if it is only 30 days or 60 days, what is going to be the best 30 days for that particular business? Right. Within that well, I, look, I'll throw something else up to you. So we're, we're right now under the, the governor's orders and we're going to slowly be reopening. I would suggest to you if, uh, and I hope this doesn't happen, but if things don't go well and then, or, or there's another outbreak or there, you can make another claim. Mm. Okay. Don't think that uh, the claim is your policy is restricted to one claim for a policy period. You can have multiple claims. They just have to be different events, right? So if you uh, have different events, you can make multiple claims related to it. 
Oh, that's an important point. Yeah, well. not related to the policy. Right, right, right. That's an important point as well. Okay. So, yeah. all right. So, so we talked about how to do it. We talked about when to do it, right? Uh, and really deciding how many times can we do it within that policy period. So I think I'm very clear on that now. That was very, very helpful for me. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about timing for a minute here. Um, you did talk that the courts were, were shut down. Um, you know, we send in a claim, um, a notification to make a claim, right? They deny it. Uh, you know, we seek your counsel, right? You get involved, shoot off a couple of letters. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, is there going to be immediate relief, you know, coverage? Is it going to drag out? You know, what does that look like? So people can just understand from a cash flow perspective what that potentially would look like. Uh, I played ultimately very conservative. I would make a presumption that you're not going to see any monies from this ever. That's all I would say, because this is, um, there are no cases specifically that discuss uh, COVID. There are no cases that discuss pandemic. Uh, and m these policies were written uh, most of them, let me just say, most of them, even if there is a virus exclusion or a bacteria exclusion, they weren't written with the thought of a pandemic. And uh, I think at the outset, depending on how the exclusion is written, that it's the presumption, let me just share with you, the, as I said earlier, the presumption is coverage. So if the presumption is coverage, they have the burden of showing that they properly excluded that coverage. Now, some uh, uh, bacterial or virus exclusions that require uh, the effect on the property are written pretty well and, and may not be, you may not be successful in getting those benefits. Some, there are some good policies that even write uh coverage for bacteria or virus that say we will cover in the event of that. Um, there are a lot of policies that have civil authority coverage and that civil authority coverage is sometimes dependent on damage to the property. Well, is it damage to the physical property? Is Does uh, COVID include damage to the property? If it's within a one mile, usually it's a one mile radius. Can you show that there was COVID somewhere else? I mean, these are, I'm just throwing all these questions out because none of them are answered. And uh, I would not uh, be, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say, this is a, uh, what I would call a lock and load case that it's just a matter of time. You're going to receive money that I wouldn't say that. But uh, I also wouldn't take cases on a contingency if I wasn't optimistic. I'm not in the business of wasting my time or energy. So I, I do think um, there will be, uh, like anything else, there will be some winners and losers. Um, some policies will withstand the challenge. Some won't. I can't predict uh, which ones those will be. But from a timing perspective, um, I don't and this is purely subjective and based on my experience, I can't envision uh, any property and casualty insurance company paying anything voluntarily on any of these. So uh, once uh, there's a crack in their defense, meaning a judge has ruled or several judges have ruled in different jurisdictions that this particular policy We seem to have frozen for a second. Hold on one second, folks. I'm sure he'll be right back. Uh oh, I think we lost uh, we lost Andrew there for a second. He'll be right back. Um, let me just uh, go over a couple of things that uh, Andrew was talking about while he jumps back in. Um, so. I mean, the takeaways that I'm, I'm, I'm left with right now are, are kind of key, right? So I think as business owners, we really need to think about um, where we are with our policies, right? Um, and where uh, we believe our, our coverage really, really lies. There's Andrew. Welcome back, Andrew. I was just uh, 
just jumping in here for one second. Um, I knew you'd be back. So welcome back again. I don't know what happened there. I think somebody photobombed me or, or uh, I think the insurance company probably did that. That's all. <laughs> I, I, always think that I, I always think my phone is wired and, and they, uh, uh, I'm, they're not, uh, I'm not their favorite person. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. You know, the, the thing hey, that I'll, I'll just say, I'll share this with you. Um, the easiest way to get rid of lawyers like me, very simple. Insurance companies do the right thing and be fair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people come to me uh, saying simply this. I don't understand. Uh, they just they lowballed me or they all insurance companies have to do is do the right thing and, and pay what they're supposed to pay. I'd be out of business. Well, you know, there's kind of a joke. I mean, two things. I, I, li I liked your uh, philosophically. I think we're on the on the same page there with time to. Uh, for the coverage repayment, which is, look, let's plan for the worst and hope for the best. You know, planning for the worst is there won't be any coverage, but to Andrew's point, he doesn't uh, take on uh, work if he doesn't think that he's going to recover. So I like that philosophy. But, but what I was saying from a timing perspective, yeah. uh, I, I really uh, can't imagine there being a resolution for two years or so by right. the time, because what will happen is the judge may make, uh, the judge will make some decisions and no doubt it'll be appealed, right? And there'll be right. several appeals. So that whole process is a minimum of two years. And I, and what I was saying, I don't know exactly where I got cut off is I just don't think uh, there'll be a, a break in the dam on the insurance company level until some of those decisions come through. Cause I think they're all aligned together and say, don't pay anything. Makes sense. No. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and, you know, the takeaway there is, look, as Andrew just pointed out, save your records. I know you all have good records. Save your records. Monthly financial statements are key here. The other thing that occurred to me, um, you know, on, on, a, uh, on a claim might also be that, you know, the number of people that contracted COVID-19 and then, you know, the business owners were forced with, hey, we're going to have to close, close shop. We're going to have to uh, kind of clean the building, uh, give the building a time to rest, right? 36 hours has been floated out there as an appropriate amount of time in order for the virus to die even after a cleaning, right? And then softly try to reopen the business. So that could be another one of those uh, triggers for filing a multiple claim within that, within that policy period. So another good, another good thought there. And for different benefits. Look, look that, that's a completely different benefit. That's a, you have a loss of profit benefit. You have a remediation benefit, property damage remediation. It's different benefits in the same policy. Oh, right. So point. you can have a policy where they have, it's called a declaration page where that's the cover page that it, you may think you only have a million dollars of insurance, but if you take it, get everything you're entitled to, it actually could balloon up to three, $4 million. Awesome. All right. Let's open this up. To, uh, I've got a couple of questions. So let's, uh, let's go to the questions and see, uh, see what's happening. Uh, I have one uh, uh, participant state farm, told them they they don't cover it blank statement from their corporate office about covid i heard a bill was to be passed to force them to cover is that still in the works the bill is still in the works right uh, uh like a good neighbor they disappear every single time right i mean they forget about state farm they're one of the worst um of course corporate came down now uh, there are some state bills going on and there's some federal bills going on with respect to coverage here. Uh, that uh, I just would not, even if those bills go through, I just wouldn't be too optimistic because retroactively requiring coverage is going to be constitutionally challenged. Um, I, I, I don't put too much faith in the, the effectiveness of legislation. It's really going to, in my opinion, it's going to be controlled based upon uh, the contract that you have with your insurance company. And State Farm has specific clauses. And now it depends on what your endorsements are specifically for your business um, and how they can, they can uh, deny a claim. But if they don't deny the claim properly, then there's coverage. There are lots, there are, this is, this is a, um, nuanced area of the law. I'll just define it that way. Yeah, and, and, and I did come across that bill, and you and I have spoke about it a couple of times. You know, in, in your opinion, was that more, 
was that an election bill, right? Was that was that a bill that somebody put out there to say, hey, I tried to do everything I could, right? That that's what I. It's politics. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't I don't think that the governor is signing too many bills that are not revenue generation for the state. Thank you for that. Uh, next question. Should the business owner send the claim directly to their insurance company or go through their broker? Uh, it really doesn't matter as long as certified, but personally, I would do both. Okay. I, I would do both. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. The, the broker has an obligation to pass it off to the carrier, uh, and it's deemed notice to the carrier if you give it to your broker. But uh, usually right on the policy, there are there is uh, who to give notice to, but I would give it to both. Awesome. Um, next question was. Uh, and and let me also just say and yeah. keep all emails back and forth. Right. Those sometimes are are uh, very valuable. Right. Don't think it's just the written correspondence, sometimes uh, emails because they're agents of the insurance company and they can bind the insurance company. OK, good advice. Um, next question was uh, Andrew made a statement that State Farm is the worst. So who's the best? I, I don't know. Well, uh, look, I don't mind answering that if you're talking about. Um, you know, business interruption, they all fall in the same category because they're all totally denying, denying, denying. Um, there are some better carriers that uh, at least yeah, that I've dealt with where they uh, ultimately pay what they should pay. Uh, Chubb is one of them. Uh, Travelers is one of them. Although Travelers has taken a very hard line on this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there are but you, you're not going to get retroactive coverage. That's for sure. Good point. That's the key point. That's a good yeah. point. Nobody's, nobody's going to issue uh, retroactive coverage. Next question. If the company does not survive, can a claim still be made and damages perhaps not calculable? Uh, definitely. So uh, the, the policy period we'll just use June to June. Um, and if a claim is made during that policy period, there's no requirement that the entity still be in existence post uh, the claim being made. It's at the, it's a snapshot in time when the claim was made. Was it a meritorious claim? And where were there damages that or benefits entitled to under the policy? Now, if the, if the um, entity goes out of business, that claim still survives and it can survive. But well, let me just caution everyone, bankruptcy plays a significant role in this. Meaning uh, if you choose bankruptcy as opposed to um, simply dissolving, uh, once somebody files bankruptcy, all claims go to the bankruptcy trustee mm -hmm. and it becomes a bankruptcy trustee's obligation to pursue that claim. And you actually just, you know, you, and those funds come in first used to pay creditors and then uh, anything left over goes to the uh, claimant. Okay, so uh, if you just be aware of that. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. We're, we're, before we run out of time, I just want to, uh, we talked about a lot of very deep and important topics here. So, you know, if you could just summarize for the, for the audience here, Andrew, uh, what they should do first, second, third, okay, as they go through this process, that would be terrific. Sure, first, uh, contract of insurance presumes coverage unless it's clearly defined. Uh, and if there's inconsistencies, it's interpreted against the insurance company, not the policy holder. So uh, you don't have to make a pre-claim determination as to whether or not you have coverage, the obligation is on the insurance company to prove there is no coverage. So uh, you should make the claim, all right? The worst that can happen is you lose the $3 or whatever for uh, the certified mail. Um, but put the obligation on the insurance company to affirmatively clearly define why you're not covered because the presumption is there is coverage, okay? Even if there's 
a, an exclusion. It has to be an exclusion that was anticipated and defined. And it, I think they're going to have some challenges uh, excluding some of the activities here. So make the claim. After you get that denial, I would encourage you to seek the advice of a uh, competent counsel who knows about policies um, and makes these motions and applications. And then when you do, uh, discuss the different uh, types of retaining them, right? Now, you, and I'm going to give, I represent some universities where the coverage is $2.5 billion of coverage. That doesn't mean that's what the claim is, but that's what the coverage is. So with that amount of coverage, uh, they may not want to do it on a contingency, right? Uh, but that, so you, it, it's a, it is, you're hiring a professional, uh, just know what your options are. So you basically have those three different choices, contingency, uh, hourly, or some blend of the two. Um, and then third, maintain all your records, keep everything, uh, document everything and, um, kind of what Michael said, uh, hope for the best, but prepare, prepare for the worst. Cause, uh, you just don't know. Uh, and I, let, let me, if I have just another minute or so, sure. I'm working with attorneys nationwide, uh, where we're trying to organize and New York happens to be the hub of this, but we're trying to organize to the extent that we can, uh, strategic, uh, litigation so that we bring the best policies forward first. Mm -hmm. that uh, we think where we have the best arguments. So uh, you should not be discouraged uh, if you're not like first in line because you want to lead with your best case. Uh, when I say best case, meaning the language of the insurance policy, because as soon as we start getting one decision, another decision, and another decision that shows there is coverage, there is coverage, there is coverage, it makes it uh, far better for the policyholder in subsequent litigations to rely on those prior interpretations. Now they wouldn't be exactly the same, but uh, that, so th this is a, um, I'll just define it as a, uh, a big strategy play where uh, there are different courts, whether it's in state court or federal court, whether it's a class action or individual action, there, there are just lots of uh, different scenarios. So. Thank you, Andrew. My As pleasure. you all know, uh, these are very challenging times and this, and this really could make a difference for your business. Please, if there's anything I can do, uh, please let me know if there's anything Andrew uh, can do. I'm sure he'd be more than willing to help you all. Um, Andrew, I, I, I really just want to thank you uh, for everybody here today and joining the show today, giving up your time. I know you're, you're a very busy man. I really, really appreciate you coming on and helping our audience understand uh, how to navigate these challenging times as it pertains to their business interruption policies. Folks, please join us again next week. Uh, we're going to be doing, a, again, an update on the PPP loan, on the forgiveness. Uh, we are expecting some more to come out. There's been some latest developments, but still a lot, a lot is unknown. Um, we imagine by next week we should have uh, a lot more certainty in the environment. Until then, stay safe, everyone, uh, and let's work hard, and hopefully we'll make a profit at the end of the day. Take care, everyone. Thank you again, Andrew. My pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Bye now.